Batman was a lot of fun to film. Uh, we had a tight schedule, which I would have liked a little bit more time so we could have really savored every moment, and really tried to pull out the best of, of our characters. But we still had a good time doing it, and I think it was a terrific production. I was told that our shooting schedule was six weeks. However, uh, I think I worked a little over 30 days, and um, I wanted a little time off, so I, I did ask them to try to cram my stuff together. Um, the locations were interesting because we got to go to Santa Barbara and use that wonderful pier there. Uh, th it attracted uh, so many folks, you know, locally, that it was tough to work on the pier, and, and Bert and I would have to leave by submarine every evening. Uh, no, we, they got us off in a boat at the ocean end of the pier because uh, we couldn't get through the other side. Technologically, we had a tremendous crew, um, and uh, everybody played their characters to the hilt. Everyone that on the crew loved doing the film. Uh, the actors and actresses, you know, enjoyed it as well. And Adam and I had a great time. I mean, we were basically reprising what we were already doing on the series. I think what was interesting about making the movie Batman was that instead of it being the first thing that we did and then a television series coming afterwards, we already had a successful t television series and the movie was like the icing on the cake. We already had a following. We uh, did the movie the, the first uh, summer hiatus after we started the series. Originally they intended to do the movie first and use the movie, the theatrical release, to sell the series. But uh, we got lucky in that the series was accepted and went on the air. We did, I think, 34 episodes and then did the movie. Um, why the movie? The movie was done to sell the series overseas. It was released overseas, and indeed it, it worked. And it kind of prepared the way for a series that nobody understood uh, the mix. Nobody. Uh, quite got it, what it was for some time. Look at this pair of joking riddles. What does a turkey do when he flies upside down? He gobbles up. Of course. And number two. What weighs six ounces sits in a tree and is very dangerous. A sparrow with a machine gun. Yes, of course. Batman was very bizarre and had no resemblance really to um, real life. Uh, and the comedic aspects of it, uh, the theater of the absurd, uh, you know, these were the things that I kind of concentrated on and, and enjoyed uh, mostly. Mm, I close my eyes and I dream of those savage Cossacks racing over the steps on their brutal mission. Mm. A strange. I close my eyes and I dream of something quite astonishingly different. We had a lot of great writers on, on, on Batman and, and on the movie. Uh, Lorenzo Semple wrote the movie. Lorenzo's uh, pilot for Batman was so excruciatingly funny to me and fresh and different. Uh, I'd never seen anything like it on television or even in the movies. And so I said uh, to my agent, um, okay, if they want me, don't leave the studio. The, sign me up now because I want to do this. I really think I've got a handle on it. And um, sure enough, uh, that was it. And I signed on and, and then they said, however, would you test uh, with a young man um, to see whether the chemistry's right. And I said, of course I would. This is, you know, something you do. When I tried out for the role of Robin, first of all, I didn't know that I was trying out for the role of Robin. I had, was selling real estate, going to acting school, studying at UCLA, and um, I sold a house to a producer who sent me to an agent who said, listen, I can't get work for my actors, so don't expect to work for a year, and if you do, it's only going to be a tiny part. And then I got a call about two weeks later. He said, go over to 20th Century Fox, uh, see this certain, certain casting director. And I said, what's it for? He said, I don't know what it is. They just said, you know, they're seeing a whole bunch of young guys. Go over there. We did a test together, and I knew instantly that Bert was absolutely the right 
person to do this. Holy guacamole, Batman! That kind of thing. He was naive and he was sensitive. He was a young guy and, and, and had very little experience. Uh, but he was, um, his uh, naivete was uh, pronounced. <laughs> and then there was a six week period after I had done the screen test that I didn't hear anything. But I was getting phone calls after about the second week from people at 20th Century Fox saying, well, what shoe size do you wear? And what's your glove size? And uh, what's the circumference of your forehead? Or whatever, all of this stuff. And, and I was trying to say, well, gee, d does that mean I'm getting closer? Do you think I, maybe I'm gonna get this role? What happened was the studio thought that my agents told me I had the role. And my agents thought that the studio told me I had the role. And actually, for four and a half weeks, I had the role, and I didn't even know about it. The same week that I found out that I had been cast as Robin, out of desperation, living at the beach, surviving by taking Coke bottles back, I tried to get a job, and I was turned down for a gas station job at $1.10 an hour. But then again, I was more happy to do Robin. What has yellow skin and rights? A ballpoint banana. Right. Two, what people are always in a hurry? Russian people? Russians! Right again. Now, what would you say they mean? Banana? Russian. I've got it! Someone Russian is gonna slip on a banana peel and break their neck! Precisely, Robin. The only possible meaning. The reason Adam and I were selected was not... I mean, I'd like to say it's because we're great actors. But that really wasn't it. What, what William Dozier, the executive producer, said to me was, Bert, we selected you out of 1,100 other young actors because in our mind, you personally, what you are, is as close to what we would imagine Robin to be. It wasn't a matter of acting, and we don't want you to, quote, act. We want you to be yourself and to be enthusiastic, and that's it, because you are, you really are what we imagine Robin to be. And Adam, being the, the gentleman that he is that wants his tea at four in the afternoon and, you know, Mr. Suave, and he, he is Batman. I think what was fun about the feature was that instead of just being limited to one villain, we had four, and we had four of the most popular villains. Our executive producer, um, Bill Dozier, and uh, producer Charlie Fitzsimons and another producer, Bill D'Angelo, had remarkable talent for picking the right people. And, you know, you think of the villains that we had. We had Cesar Romero, the great Latin lover. We put white makeup over his mustache because Cesar would not shave the mustache that gave him a career. But um, <clears throat> uh, Burgess Meredith, who had, you know, a long, uh, wonderful career in movies on the stage. Um, Frank Gorshin, with his manic intensity as Riddler. Leanne Merriweather as Catwoman. Uh, although uh, Julie Newmar was our main Catwoman in the series, she was uh, filming a movie called McKenna's Gold at the time, so we needed another Catwoman, and uh, Leanne Merriweather was terrific. Right. We have to do something to get Batman out of the way. Favorite villain? I would have to say Catwoman, and you guys know what I mean. I had three Catwomen. It's 27 lives, isn't it, that I had to go through? You give me curious stirrings in my utility belt, Catwoman. My first day on the set, it was an exterior uh, on the back lot at Fox, that this series might be somewhat different, in that um, as I arrived and sat down in my chair, the Riddler's car exploded in front of me, and sh rubber shrapnel flew by my head. And there were screams and uh, people running. And I sat there just kind of thinking, do I want to put that cowl on or not? On the series and on the movie, I had a wonderful stuntman. But my stuntman, Victor Paul, a terrific guy, always seemed to be off having a coffee with Adam while I'm getting hurt with the Batman stuntman, Hubie Kearns. You know, I, I, they had a policy you know, on Batman. And that was, if there's ever anything really dangerous, always use Bert. And as a result of that, uh, I was constantly in the emergency hospital. You know, I thought I was an unlucky guy. Uh, and, and, and during the first episode, I mean, four days in a row in the emergency hospital, I didn't think I was going to survive uh, the first week. I think that we had a, a, a marvelous uh, 
prop department and special effects department. They did get a little overzealous from time to time. And I remember poor Bert, as Robin was blown off tables and uh, singed a bit. We had a contraption called the Bat Cycle. And I used to ride a motorcycle back and forth to work and so on, and I was okay on the Bat Cycle. But poor Bert, not so good, because he was in the sidecar. And you see Batman would push a little button and give an order, whatever, and that sidecar was then rigged, we thought, to go in a certain direction and end up at a certain point. It very seldom did that. So Bert would be screaming and white-knuckled. <laughs> I'd push the button and he would careen away from the bat cycle and he never knew, I didn't know where he was gonna end up. I mean, one time I think he went over a pier into the water. There was a, another time he went into, there was a chicken farm and he went into the, the where the chickens lay there. It was terrible. Um, but Bert was very brave about these things. He was naive. <laughs> we had some very interesting thing happen on the on the Batman movie. A little bit scary. Uh, it was the last fight scene that we had, and we were fighting all the four villains and their henchmen on the Penguin submarine. And this was filmed out at uh, uh, Fox's ranch out in the Malibu area, where they had a, it's like a big lake. It was really incredible, but it was only about four feet deep, and they had. Um, uh, various bars and stuff under the water that they used to tie things down and one of the stuntmen who dove into the water hit his head and um, uh, the, he's lucky he didn't die. But he turned out it's okay, everything turned out great. What Batman the movie gave us was an opportunity with a little bit bigger budget to have more toys in there. For example, we had the Batcopter. We had um, the Batboat. We also had never filmed going up the bat pole. We'd always been sliding down the bat pole, so now we had going up the bat pole, which they, they pulled that footage and they used it a lot in subsequent uh, you know, episodes of the show. We had that infamous Batman and Robin wall walk. When you think Batman, with people in weird outfits, like the four super crooks hanging around here, it's amazing someone hasn't already reported this place to the police. Somebody told me at one point that we had 250 guest stars, and among them, uh, people who wanted to do the show, uh, Frank Sinatra, Bobby Kennedy, people like that, and people would pop out of a window, as you probably remember, and it could be anybody from Jerry Lewis to Dick Clark, you know. We had, uh, my, let's see, we had Tallulah Bankhead, Carolyn Jones, and Baxter. There were those who, who did Batman as, I think, the first uh, jobs. Uh, Jim Brolin, um, Rob Reiner, uh, Terry Garr, Vincent Price as Egghead was wonderful. And one day, as part of the, toward the end of the, the show, he was supposed to throw eggs. Well, they brought in dozens of old, old eggs. And he threw a few eggs, and I didn't like it. Bert didn't. Nobody liked it. We started to throw eggs back, and it became this huge egg fight with this terrible, smelly mess of eggs on the stage. It broke the tension, and but it was the biggest, most horrible omelet you've ever been in. Both Adam and I tried to do our laughing before the take, but that didn't always happen. The problem is, when you put Adam and I together, there is some chemical reaction. I'm not sure what it is. It's been 35 years, I still don't know what it is. But something happens when you put the two of us together and everybody starts laughing. I mean, we start laughing, everybody laughs. One of my favorite uh, scenes remains that bomb scene in the movie. Our director, Les Martinson Jr., I'd worked with before, Les was marvelous because he elaborated he staged, he set up that scene so that it was more than what we were presented with on paper or whatever. And I had a chance to improvise a bit, but Les gave us the ducks and the nuns and the lovers in the boat so that that particular sequence became an arc of frustration. And to have it end with that line. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. 
these are moments that um, are played by people on the street when I see them all the time. I hear that wherever I go. I wonder what they mean. Some days you can't get rid of a bomb. I hope it doesn't reflect on my entire career. Kids love Batman. It's hero worship. It's clean. It's wonderful entertainment. And it's something the family can enjoy together. And, uh, and I think what's going to be interesting about this DVD is I think there's going to be a lot of DVD equipment that is worn out with Batman being played over and over and over. Because these kids, they love this hero worship. Every, every kid in the world wants to be a superhero. I had very little in common with Bruce Wayne. Um, uh, the only thing I think I had in common w with Batman, really, was uh, a moral fiber. I was taught early on to be honest and not take myself too damn seriously. Our job is finished. Holy DVD, Batman! Play. My name is George Barris, and I'm here with probably the world's most famous automobile. Without a doubt, still number one, after many, many decades, the famous television 1966 Batmobile. I'm proud to say that I was the designer and original builder of this automobile for a great television show with Dozier at 20th Century Fox called Batman. Adam West, Burt Ward, and many, many great, great stars. I have a lot of stories to tell you about this famous car. We had three weeks. When Dozier came to me with Bob Kane and Adam West, they said, what can you give us for the 20th century in 1966? And with Dozier's concept of Batman, with the pow and the bang and the wow, I had a bing, a car that would also go with the bings and the bangs and the same thing. We had to have rocket tubes. We had to have gas knobs. We had to have seat injectors. Also, to catch the Joker. We threw some oil out there so he would skid out. To catch the Briddler, we throw some nails out so it would puncture his tires. Just to give you an idea of the crime-fighting implements that we had in the 60s compared to now in the year 2000. Bob Kane had a Batman car way back in the 40s when he created the comic strip with a bat face cut out in the front of a Lincoln Zephyr. I said, I want to incorporate the bat features into the car, not just a plaque stuck onto it. So I made the, the ears into the fenders. I made the lights become the headlights. I made the nose become the chain slicer. The grill extended out and it became part of the front end. Then from there it flowed on back where I had the 15 foot bat fin fingers in the back which had the splices and the double bubble we had for both Adam and Burt Ward. I locked the door shut and I made Burt and Adam both jump over the doors and into the fenders so that they get inside the car just to give you an idea of something again different made them very athletic that means they were really the crime fighters we had to incorporate the injector seats so that if somebody went to steal the car they had the wrong key the wrong word and then they would push the wrong buttons and we would just shoot them right out of the car of course we elevated them with cables everything had to work because we didn't have the electronics and the computers and the special effects that give you illusion on the screens like you do today. We had to make them actually operate. That when you seen the smoke, it was smoke. You seen the burner coming out of the back? Well, we didn't have the big force, great flames. We used kerosene, an igniter, and a fan to blow out the exhaust flames. I was in a show in a town called Fargo, North Dakota. And we were doing a press media shot. And I'm driving down the 
street with the press people, and all of a sudden, wah, 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 and I pull over, and this guy gets out. He says, you have no windshield wipers on that car, and your taillights are not right. He says, I'm going to impound that car. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, officer. We're just doing a, a test or a press shot for the TV, and, and I don't care what you're trying to say. He called the tow truck in, towed in the car, hauled me into the police station, and arrested me. We go before the judge, and the judge looks, and he looks at his officer, and he says, Wilbur, do you realize what you did? And he says, what do you mean? He says, you impounded the famous Batmobile, and you threw Mr. Barris in jail. He said, I'm going to demote you to a dog catcher. In reminiscing about the movie, it was kind of a lot of fun, because we had more time to make adaptions. Because this car weighs 6,000 pounds. That's three tons, to give you an idea of the difference in the weight. The engine? big old Ford. Well, and in fact, the car started out as an experimental Lincoln Futura. That's the first thing everybody asked me. What was it? Was it a Pontiac? Was it a T-Bird? Was it a Chevy? Experimental Lincoln Futura. That I mean, it was a concept car. It was never a production car. We actually took the car from a scene called Started Without a Kiss with Debbie Reynolds and Glenn Ford, where I used the car in the first implement of the shows, which was another movie. From there, from the three weeks I had to build the automobile, we created the Batmobile. This is the number one car. We had to build five of them. The reason why is that each car had to do a different thing. The stunt car was number five car. It did all the chases and the jumps and all that. The number four car was the race car. That was the car that had drag racing scenes against our famous Green Hornet, Van Williams and Bruce Lee. The number three car was an exhibition car. It was the one that was used for exhibition. Number two car was a double for the number one car. But the car had to start somewhere before it really went into the full-size car. And actually, we have the model. This little model here was made where we would be able to get the size and the spectra scenes that we were able to use also through some of the filming. And it was in scale, actually a third size. Here we are. 35 years or more later, and still in more demand than any of the other famous movie and TV cars.